As of 9 a.m. on the 28th of March, a total of 120,776 people have been tested, of which 103,687 were confirmed negative and 17,089 were confirmed positive. As of 5 p.m. on the 27th of March, 1,019 patients in the UK who tested positive for coronavirus have sadly died. As with our population, for businesses large and small, coronavirus represents an unprecedented challenge. Speaking with business leaders and representative organisations every day, I appreciate just how tough the situation is. When we tell people to stay at home, to protect the NHS and save lives, we know it has a real cost to your families and to your firms. And I want to thank the many businesses and workers right across the UK who are playing a vital role in keeping the British economy going. You are delivering for our nation through this difficult time. And we said we would deliver for you, doing whatever it takes. That is why we have taken unprecedented action to support our economy, to save jobs and secure livelihoods. To help businesses pull through at this difficult time, we have set out income support schemes for both the employed and self-employed, as well as a package of grants, loans, business rate holidays and VAT deferrals. Businesses and trade unions have welcomed our interventions. And I want to reassure them that we are working around the clock to get the funding as quickly as possible to where it is needed. On Monday, we launched the Coronavirus Business Interruption Loan Scheme. This scheme is designed to make it easier for businesses with a turnover of up to £45 million to access vital financial support. So far, the scheme's 40 accredited lenders, including all of the high street banks, are processing thousands of applications. This week, I provided guidance to English councils on the grants to our smallest businesses, including those operating in the retail, hospitality and leisure sectors. The first tranche of funding arrived with the English councils yesterday. And I want to ensure that the grant money is with businesses as soon as possible, providing direct funding support to almost a million businesses across our country. Now, whilst our companies have requested financial support, they have also asked us to look to ease the burden of regulation at this challenging time. And we have responded to that request. Yesterday, we brought forward legislation to temporarily suspend some competition rules in the supermarket sector and in the operation of Isle of Wight ferries. From retailers sharing delivery vans to ferry operators coordinating staff, these measures will allow firms to work together to deliver vital services to the public more effectively at this time. We've also introduced measures to ensure that workers who have not taken all of their statutory annual leave due to COVID-19 will now be able to carry that entitlement over into the next two years. This will protect staff from losing out whilst providing businesses with flexibility when they need it most. Earlier this week, together with Companies House, we announced that over four million businesses will be granted a three-month extension to the filing of their accounts through a fast-track online process. Over 10,000 businesses have already successfully applied for this extension. And we will continue to monitor the company's abilities to meet the range of other filing obligations they have under the Companies Act and we will provide further extensions if needed. I recognise just how hard employees, business owners and directors are working to keep their companies going. It is crucial that when the crisis passes, as it will, we are ready to bounce back. And so today, I want to announce more measures which are designed to give businesses greater flexibility as they face the current crisis to help them emerge intact the other side of the COVID-19 pandemic. 
we will introduce measures to improve the insolvency system, which provides the legal options for companies running into major difficulties. Our overriding objective is to help UK companies which need to undergo a financial rescue or restructuring process to keep trading. These measures will give those firms extra time and space to weather the storm and be ready when the crisis ends, whilst ensuring that creditors get the best return possible in the circumstances. The changes to the insolvency regime will include new rules to make sure companies undergoing restructuring can continue to get hold of supplies and raw materials. And there will be a temporary suspension of wrongful trading provisions for company directors to remove the threat of personal liability during the pandemic. This provision will have retrospective effect from the 1st of March. However, to be clear, all of the other checks and balances that help to ensure directors fulfil their duties properly will remain in force. We will bring forward legislation in these areas at the earliest opportunity. We will also put in place measures to ensure that companies required to hold annual general meetings can do so flexibly in a manner which is compatible with the best public health guidance. This might include postponing or holding the AGM online or by phone using only proxy voting. In addition, we are also introducing a range of measures to boost the supply of personal protective equipment, such as face masks, to protect frontline NHS staff. And we're removing administrative barriers to the production of hand sanitizer. By reducing the amount of red tape, new suppliers and businesses that produce ingredients for safe hand sanitizer will be able to bring their products to market in a matter of days. Companies, including BrewDog and Ineos, have already stepped forward to offer their services. I'm incredibly proud of how businesses and individuals across our great nation have risen to the challenge posed by COVID-19. Whether it is offers from companies coming forward to support the ventilator challenge, or more than 700,000 people signing up to volunteer for our brilliant NHS, or those in the public and private sector working hard to keep our country safe and moving. Britain is meeting the challenge, working together in a joint endeavour to get through this pandemic. And be in no doubt, the government will continue to fight tooth and nail to protect lives and livelihoods everywhere in this country. As we stand shoulder to shoulder with our people and our businesses. Thank you. We will um, now move to the um, question and answer session. Uh, I think the first question is from the BBC, from Dominic Hughes. Dominic, please. Yes, good afternoon. Uh, questions mainly for Professor Powis, I think. How full are intensive care units in London and around the UK at the moment? Are there any hospitals that have run out of beds or are close to capacity? How many spare ventilator beds do we still have? And then on testing, has testing of NHS staff who are currently having to self-isolate, has that started now? How many tests have currently been done? Thanks. So thank you very much. Uh, so on the question of ITU capacity, uh, as you know, the NHS has been working incredibly hard uh, to increase uh, the capacity beyond the 4,000 or so uh, beds that we uh, typically have. Uh, and that has been uh, pursued um, firstly in London, although work is going on all over the country, uh, because as you are also aware, uh, the infection has uh, spread a bit quicker in London. Uh, so we are not at capacity yet within London, uh, but uh, beds are being opened all the time to produce that extra surge capacity. So in the first instance, uh, we are using theatres and recovery areas. So those are areas in hospitals uh, where uh, 
anaesthetic machines, ventilators are already used for surgery and can be readily adapted to take critically ill patients. And that has already occurred. You may have seen some of that in London hospitals. And that's almost doubling the capacity that we have already. Uh, we are not using it at the moment, but clearly uh, the number of patients is increasing each day. So we are expanding that capacity in advance. You will also have seen the plans at the NHS Nightingale uh, in East London uh, to initially bring on another 500 beds if they are needed. Uh, and we aim to get that up and ready for patients uh, next week. So at the moment, I'm confident the capacity is there. We have not reached capacity, and I'm also confident that capacity is expanding, particularly in London, so that we keep ahead of increase uh, in patient numbers. Thank you. Uh, and on the testing, um, as the Chief Executive of the NHS said yesterday, uh, it is absolutely critical that we now begin to introduce testing for staff. And as I've said before, just to explain, that's really important for two reasons. Firstly, because um, if we have staff at home either self-isolating themselves or in quarantine because a member of the family has symptoms, uh, if it turns out that it's not because of coronavirus and we can bring that staff member back, that is really important for the workforce, particularly in critical areas such as critical care clinicians or emergency department clinicians. And those are the groups, uh, paramedics as well, I should say, that we will be focusing on first. And secondly, because if they are positive, when they do come back, uh, they can be confident they will have some immunity. And that will be really important going forward as we understand which parts of the workforce have had this virus and are therefore likely to be immune. Uh, so, as um, Simon Stevens said yesterday, we are now beginning, to, as we ramp up testing, which we're doing all the time, to use that extra capacity over and above that which we need for patients to start to test uh, NHS uh, staff. So we're working with NHS organisations as I speak uh, to ensure uh, that that testing will be available uh, over the next few days uh, for their critical staff. Thank you, uh, Stephen. I think we move on to ITV. Uh, Paul Brandt. Paul. Yeah, thank you, Business Secretary. Secretary of State, first of all, could you give us an update, please, on the health of the Prime Minister, the Health Secretary, and whether the Chief Medical Officer has now been tested for COVID-19? And to the Medical Director, if I may, given the number of deaths we've seen in the past couple of days, what hope is there that we're not on the same trajectory as countries like Italy? And given the rate of increase, can the NHS cope at this current level? Uh, Paul, thank you very much for that. Um, well, as you heard yesterday in the press conference, uh, the Prime Minister is showing mild symptoms. Uh, he continues to lead the government's effort in uh, combating COVID-19. Uh, this morning, he held a video conference call, and he will continue to lead right from the front on this. But I think the one thing this has reminded us is that no one is immune, and that is precisely why we ask people to follow the government advice in terms of staying at home, where they're absolutely able to do that, uh, we want to make sure we protect the NHS and ultimately save lives. Stephen. Yes, so um, clearly there has been a big increase uh, in deaths uh, today and every death is tragic and of course we need to do everything that we can to ensure that we don't lose the lives of loved ones to this terrible virus. Uh, but as Sir Patrick Valance, I think the Chief uh, Scientific Advisor of the Government said recently, uh, if we can keep deaths below 20,000 we will have done very well in this epidemic. Uh, it's early uh, at the moment and the scientists who are working with government to model what we can expect are of course adjusting uh, their predictions now as we start to see the actuality of the epidemic in the UK rather than what we believe might have happened a few weeks ago. Um, if we do reduce the deaths uh, to uh, a level which is below what we initially thought, I want to be absolutely clear that won't be because we are somehow lucky. It won't be because somehow the virus is acting in this country differently from any other country. It will be because every citizen in this country, the British public, have complied with the instructions that the government has given based on the best scientific evidence to reduce the transmission of the disease. We can beat this virus, we can reduce the number of deaths, but only if we reduce the spread and the transmission. Now is not the time to be complacent. Now is the time to really, really lock down and, and hone down on what we've been asked to do. Uh, as I've said before, it's not somebody else's responsibility, it's all our responsibilities. Uh, if we are to uh, ensure 
that we keep within NHS capacity, and of course, as I said earlier, we are extending capacity all the time, every one of us has a part to play, and we know that can work. Great. Thank you very much for that. Uh, the next question is from LBC, Ben Kentish. Ben. Thank you, Ben Kentish, LBC. Secretary of State, you've told people to stay at home, but you've also told them to go to work if, of course, they're unable to work from home. At LBC, we've had lots of calls from people saying they simply don't feel safe at work. And while the government's urged employers to be responsible for this, and it's clear some have, it's also clear that many aren't. So what will the government do to protect those people who are having to go to work, key workers and non-key workers, to make sure they're safe to do so? And if I may, to Professor Powis, Last week, Boris Johnson said he was confident or hopeful that we could turn the tide within 12 weeks. That was before these uh, more extreme social distancing measures were introduced. And there's now some talk that the peak could be as little as three weeks away. Are you confident we can now turn the tide sooner than 12 weeks? Thank you. Ben, thank you very much for that. Um, so we've always been very clear right from the start of the situation is that we will be led by the scientific and medical advice. Uh, and that also applies to the framing of any guidance that we have put out when it comes to how people should conduct themselves when it comes to work. Uh, we have set out a detailed list of non-essential businesses which we have required to close, and I want to thank those businesses for acting responsibly. Uh, we've also said that wherever possible, people should work from home, and very many people across our country have responded to that. It is, however, the case there are certain workplaces where you are not able to work from home, uh, such as the manufacturing sector, where you uh, will be required to go into work. We've said that people should, uh, on those occasions, look to go into work. However, it is also incumbent on employers to make sure that they follow the Public Health England guidelines and they keep their employees safe. And uh, that certainly is what uh, very many employers are doing. Uh, I have conversations every day with uh, businesses, uh, with business representative groups, and I understand from those conversations that they are indeed adapting uh, and they're also making sure that where it's required, they're issuing their staff with PPE. But if there are instances that uh, people feel that uh, organisations and businesses are not behaving uh, appropriately in terms of their duty of care, then of course there are organisations like the HSE who should be informed. Stephen. So, so what I am confident of is that um, it is possible to get on top of uh, this virus. Uh, and I'm confident for several reasons. Uh, one, because as a scientist and somebody who listens to our colleagues, our epidemiologists who understand this, as I said earlier, uh, if we can reduce the transmission rate, the amount of spread from individual to individual, then the virus will start to decline in the population. That is a simple uh, set of maths um, that underpins uh, all these uh, measures that have been put in. And so if we all comply with the measures and reduce that amount of transmission, then yes, we will begin to see uh, a drop in uh, the amount of virus circulating. And, and I'm also confident because we've seen other countries uh, who have taken countries take slightly different approaches, but the fundamental rationale is always the same to reduce transmission. We have seen that begin to work. The time frame, I think, is difficult uh, to determine, but I think we will see uh, over the course of the next month exactly how that will uh, play out uh, here in the UK. But as I said earlier, uh, this is not the time to be complacent. This is the time uh, to really bear down and for all of us to act responsibly to reduce that transmission. And if we do that, then the quicker we will turn the tide on this uh, and the quicker uh, we will be confident that we can stay within the capacity that the NHS is planning. Great. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, the next question is from The Sun on Sunday. Uh, Dave Wooding. Dave. Uh, Secretary of State, um, it seems that this virus has infected the heart of government. Um, one could be forgiven thinking that the, the, with the Prime Minister ill and members of his cabinet and officials, uh, that, that some of them are going down like flies. How can you run an effective government when it's, uh, when it's rampant uh, at the very heart of Westminster? And of course, if this is infecting the NHS in, in similar, at similar levels, what does that mean for the treatment uh, of people who are suffering from this virus. And secondly, can you just perhaps give us some uh, indication of what's being done to bring home um, some uh, British subjects who are abroad, uh, stranded, and we've seen some of the pleas from them about the difficulties they're having in getting home. 
Uh, Dave, thank you very much for that. Um, can I be absolutely clear is that uh, the Prime Minister has had uh, mild symptoms, but he's absolutely leading the response uh, from the front. Uh, the government is totally united in ensuring that we combat this virus and that we bounce back the other side of it. So um, I want to be very clear about that, is that uh, there are no gaps in government. Uh, we are collectively all working very hard, led by the Prime Minister. Uh, you raised the issue about uh, getting our people back. Uh, uh, my colleagues in the FCO, Dominic Raab, other colleagues, are working incredibly hard and uh, night and day to make sure that we can get uh, Brits back to the UK. Uh, we will continue to work with airlines to get them back from around the world, and of course, in the first instance, through commercial means, uh, but also through repatriation flights and exceptional circumstances, uh, for instance, by chartering. And as you know, a, a British Airways charter flight arrived back from Peru yesterday, and the FCO are, of course, working very hard to get more flights confirmed in the coming days. Uh, Stephen, did you want to add anything? Yes, so um, NHS staff are obviously critical for the reasons that I've uh, mentioned and the reasons you know, and, and they, they are, uh, like any member of the public, uh, a possibility that they will, they will get the virus. Clearly, we keep them protected at work, but uh, they too uh, uh, will, uh, will um, have to self-isolate and quarantine quite rightly uh, if they develop symptoms that are compatible with uh, uh, COVID-19. Uh, of course, in the work that we are doing to increase NHS capacity, uh, we have to take into account that some of our staff uh, will be uh, off for those reasons. Uh, and I can assure you that uh, we have been planning for this since, uh, since January, since very early on, uh, even before uh, the World Health Organization called it a pandemic. Uh, and we have taken into account, local organizations do take into account, that there will be a degree of absenteeism of staff. And as I also said earlier, uh, that's the reason that uh, rolling out testing to NHS staff, which is what we are doing now, uh, is the critical first step in ensuring uh, that where staff don't have COVID-19, they can come back to the workforce as quickly as possible. Thank you for that. Uh, the next question is from the Sunday Telegraph. Uh, Ed Malnick. Ed. Thank you. The government's talked about hospitals now getting the quantities of protective equipment that they need. Can you guarantee that all hospitals will get the same level of PPE, like the FFP3 masks? Um, that's Professor Powers. And Mr Sharma, the government's appealed for help from industry to produce ventilators. Is it getting the support it needs to produce PPE and tests, or do you need more help from industry? And when will the first of the 3.5 million antibody tests be used in this country? Great. So, so again, on personal protective equipment, PPE, obviously uh, critical uh, to uh, management of patients uh, with COVID-19 and to the protection of staff. Uh, so we are putting uh, supplies of PPE out into healthcare organisations constantly. So over 170 million of the very highest level masks uh, and in the last couple of weeks and just in the last day, a couple of days, 40 million gloves, 25 million face masks, 14 million aprons, uh, so vast numbers going out. Uh, we are strengthening the supply chain every day to ensure that every organisation gets the equipment uh, that they need. Uh, that is uh, an absolute priority uh, for us. Uh, great. Thank you very much for that. Well, Ed, uh, as I've announced today, we are making changes so that we can get more uh, hand sanitizers into the system and make sure that we get more uh, PPE equipment into the system. So specifically in terms of PPE, the measures that we have undertaken is that the Office for Product Safety and Standards, which actually sits in, in my department, has written to notified bodies uh, on this issue. The notified bodies are the ones that are recognized as experts who test products for safety requirements. And we have asked them to prioritize the testing of any new PPE supply as a matter of priority. We want to put PPE testing to the front of the queue. Thank you. I think we have one final question from the Mail on Sunday. Uh, Brendan Carlin. Brendan. Good afternoon. Um, could I ask um, Professor Powers, first of all, uh, on the subject of the, uh, the latest study by Imperial College suggesting that uh, we could be on course for much lower number of deaths than at first feared. Does that align with the government's own thinking? Is that something you, that modelling that you yourself uh, uh, agree with? And, and a question, if I can, to the Secretary of State. Um, 
Can I ask you, you, you you've spoken of fighting uh, today, fighting the, um, the pandemic tooth and nail and doing everything you can. Um, as far as many people abroad, British citizens abroad um, uh, are concerned, that looks a bit, that, that may ring hollow as it looks though we're lagging behind other countries in getting our citizens back. Aren't you concerned about that? So, so on the modelling, I think I alluded to this uh, in, a, in a previous answer. Uh, so, of course, the, the government um, is very much basing the response in this country, quite rightly, quite rightly in my view, on the best scientific advice. And the Imperial Academic uh, Group and a number of other academic groups are providing some of the uh, scientific underpinning. Uh, that is managed through the uh, Scientific Advisory Group for Emergency, SAGE, a group you might have heard of, chaired by the government's chief scientific advisor, Sir Patrick Valance. Uh, and, and that group will take account of a number of uh, inputs from various academic groups, including uh, colleagues at Imperial. But, but as I said earlier, um, and the number of deaths that arise out of this epidemic in the UK, uh, if it's less than 20,000, as Sir Patrick Vallance said, that, that would be a good result, although every death, as I've said, is, is absolutely a tragedy. Uh, but we shouldn't be complacent about that, although that would be a good result. It will only happen uh, if we uh, stop the transmission of the virus. And, and I sound like a broken record player on this, but, but it really is the way that if we're going to get to the numbers of deaths that you're talking about, it doesn't happen by luck. It's not just chance. It's because of the actions that you take, that I take, that we all take to reduce the transmission of the virus. So it is possible to get on top of this virus, uh, but you do that by stopping the transmission. That's the basis of social distancing. That's what the government has introduced on the best uh, scientific advice. That's what other countries have done. And we have seen in previous epidemics that it is a successful measure. So I cannot emphasize enough to everybody watching today that you have the chance to save a life. You have a chance to stop a ventilator being used that otherwise would need to be used. It really is as simple as that. This is not complex. The science behind it might be complex, but the reality is incredibly simple. Avoid contact with others where you can, stay at home. If you're symptomatic, isolate, and that will result in fewer deaths and less pressure on the NHS. It is that stark for all of us. Uh, Brennan, just coming back to your question about whether we're being slower than other countries, uh, I don't think that is the case. Uh, where there have been no other options uh, for British nationals to uh, come back to the UK, we of course have laid on repatriation flights. I, uh, made uh, uh, mention of uh, the, the flight that arrived back from Peru yesterday, and we will continue to work round the clock to make sure that we get our people back. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I think that's uh, the final question. Can I just end by saying that we are doing absolutely everything we can to support businesses and our people, but we have to make sure that everyone follows the advice that we have put out there, and that is stay at home, protect the NHS, and save lives. Thank you. So that's uh, Alex Sharma, uh, Business Secretary and Professor Powers, Medical Director of NHS England, then uh, presenting that press conference today. Uh, Jonathan, 